Our next speaker, he served in the U.S. House since uh, 2003 and represents Iowa's 4th Congressional District. He's a senior member of the Agriculture Committee, as well as chairing its subcommittee on both operations and oversight. Tonight, he's going to explain to us how we can solve America's energy problem by first starting at home. At this point, I'd love to, I'd love to introduce my dear friend, but uh, I have my assistant here who wants to introduce him. Come on up. Steve King. <laughs> Valerie, that's beautiful and unique. Ah, oh, thank you so much. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. I've never had one like that before. <laughs> But I do have four granddaughters about your age. And uh, I appreciate the chance to be here. I Digging in my pockets for my notes, I see this little note that says Big Ten. And I'm not going to miss this opportunity to congratulate Mallory for opening up on the New York Times bestseller list, fourth, on the fourth open up Big Ten. And uh, I appreciate an advanced copy of the book. I... Uh, also, I was going to run my own timer here because I can't see the sand in that thing and I can't figure out where it's going. But um, <laughs> I might turn that over part way through. Uh, <laughs> but I want to talk about energy, but I might range a little bit further afield too um, because uh, some of the discussion we've had has piqued my interest in things that I think are important that we talk about. I just want to tell you my overall picture on energy is this. First of all, everything we do takes energy, uh, whether it's to warm up a cup of coffee or whether it's to travel here, uh, whether it's to dig up a ton of coal, it takes energy to do that. And uh, we're gonna, we need to be competitive in the, global, in the global marketplace. That means we must have cheap energy. It's extraordinary that this country is so blessed with so many different varieties of energy that we have. And I'm for all energy all the time. I'm for grow the size of the energy pie. I want, also let me start with, I want more clean burning coal. I want nuclear. I want more petroleum. I want to drill everywhere all the time. I want to frack, and I want to see North Dakota frack its way down to Iowa. <laughs> You know, our fear of nuclear is unfounded. It's the safest energy there is. And uh, somehow or another, we heard about Chernobyl and decided that we we're going to shut down our development of nuclear. It's in our heads. It's not, it's not rational. And I come from this part of the Midwest where we decided back in the beginning, going into the 1980s, Jimmy Carter embargoed grain. And he sent us to the bottom of the economic cycle, the farm crisis, the energy crisis, and the housing crisis. 3,500 banks went under. My bank went under. I saw what that was like. I saw what it was like when corn was worth less than two bucks and $300 an acre is all you get out of that land. And we decided we're going to put some energy into the marketplace because we do something well. We raise corn. Now we need to market it better. But you couldn't sell it because petroleum had 100% lock on the nozzle. Well, so we got busy politically and we unlocked the nozzle. There is no subsidy for corn based ethanol today, it's gone. It was 51 cents a gallon in 2008. It went down to 45, and now it's gone. And the cheapest buy on the marketplace per BTU was last year, for most of last year, corn-based ethanol. So put that into the mix. This, is, this somehow or another gets a bad name. It competes out there with everything else. And I say all energy all the time. Let's not lock anything out. Because if we lock out corn-based ethanol, we're also at the same time, then we're giving a 100% mandate for petroleum to go in gas-burning cars. 24% of the gallons produced a year ago, 24% of the gallons produced domestic, domestically that are produced, that are, that are burned in, in gas-burning vehicles on the streets of America, 24% was out of our cornfields. Now, if you take 24% of any marketplace out, you know what happens to that market. It goes up. Is it 50 cents a gallon? Is it a buck 50? I don't know, but it's part of the equation. So let's get it out there and let's compete in the marketplace, all energy, all the time. And if we don't, some of these things that sound a little like doom and gloom to me that's coming from parts of the world. Nobody said North Korea yet, uh, but North Korea and Iran. Those things, those things become greater threats to the United States of America. When I was first elected to Congress, I asked, well, a couple years into it, I asked this question. Do we have the capability to take out North Korea's nuclear capability at the same time we would, have, we would take out Iran's nuclear capability? The answer I got back from a top person in the Pentagon was, if you were resided in the Oval Office and asked that question of the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the next morning it'd be in the New York Times and your endeavor would be over. 
We can't even ask the question what our military capabilities are before we start negotiating and devolve our way all the way down to what Daniel Pipes talked about was this this minute this focus on on Israel and, and Palestine. I'm a strong supporter of Israel. I think that Barack Obama has has diminished the capability of Israel to take out Iran's nuclear capability. I, if you send somebody over there, like maybe your chief of staff in the early years, if you keep sending messages when you disp Benjamin Netanyahu, what's going to happen? He loses his confidence and ability to do what maybe they have to do for the very survival of Israel. And I think we need to step up and support them, and we need to be a lot stronger. But we have a president, though, that runs the foreign policy. That is implied in the Constitution, and we do give some deference to that. It's going to be a long, hard slog, to quote our former Secretary of Defense, before we get uh, to, to the next President of the United States. We have leadership in the House of Representatives that thinks in terms of this. They think of socialized medicine in this country as the Affordable Care Act. Well, if you start out thinking like that, by the way, that's not the name. It's the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And when they say that, nobody knows what that means, but we buy into their rhetoric. It's Obamacare. It's socialized medicine. It's an unconstitutional takings of our management of our health. And we let the president do that. And we let Eric Holder go out in this thing called the Justice Department and commit injustice against the American people. I asked him under oath the other day, have you ever investigated, convened a grand jury, or indicted any member of the Obama administration? Well, there's no yes answer to that. I didn't get an answer. But there are a whole list of things that he did do aggressively. And I go down through the list, including investigate two Republican governors that were going on. And so, I want to conclude as the sand has run out of the hourglass, not of my life, but my time here. <laughs> I want you to think about this image. Kids that started high school when Barack Obama took office. Four years of realizing what goes on in the world. Then they go off to college, second term. Four years of realizing what goes on in the world. Then they step out into the real world. Their memory of their experience of what's right in this country will be what's wrong in this country. That's Barack Obama. This gonna, we're going to have to put America back together. <laughs> SteveKing.com <laughs> First question, David Asman. Uh, Congressman, you're in favor of nuclear energy. Are you also in favor of ending government subsidies of the insurance policies for nuclear power plants? That's a big question, David. And you know, I it's a big question, but it's a very simple question. Are you in favor of ending the subsidies <laughs> for insurance policies for nuclear power plants? The, 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 it's a simple question, and if I gave you a simple answer, it wouldn't be a fully informed answer. And so I have to go back and look at that policy. That topic has not come up in front of me, and the time that I've sat in Congress and looked into the data, I'd have to look at the data and see what it means, but I can't give you a, a simple answer. It's more complex for me. Um, you, have, you have a second question. Uh, well, I mean, uh, the, the bottom line is that, that subsidies have become so integrated into our into our national economy uh, that even a, a relatively simple, because for the audience, I'm sure most of them know that we have spent tens of billions of dollars on, on subsidies, government subsidies for nuclear power plants because they could not afford insurance policies on their own. Now, whether they should have to take out these insurance policies is another question, but the market has decided that they might. So how do you, how do you disentangle uh, this economy from from subsidies that have have become so ingrained that that you're not even able right now to answer whether those subsidies should be ended for nuclear power plants. Okay. Um, let me say this that I don't know what those claims are. I don't know what the premiums are, but we can also give statutory protection for nuclear power plants. That's something that's within the realm of Congress, and I would look at this with that in mind against the cost itself. And so we have the constitutional authority to do that, to give statutory protection. That's worth a look. I've not given it any consideration, though. I wish you would. Well, Carrie. Can I just say I appreciate that you said I don't know. That's pretty rare for a politician. <laughs> It's rare for me, too. <laughs> uh, um, so this administration, so on the topic of energy, so it just came out recently that the administration is, is going to yet again punt on the Keystone Pipeline issue, um, despite mountains of evidence saying that this would not do damage to the, uh, the environment. So does Congress have any leverage? I mean, what sort of remedy could there be here? Because it seems at this point it's all going to just go from Canada to China and it's going to go overseas. And this oil is going to get shipped out. But 
is there anything that Congress can do to sort of bypass this administration? You know, well, there's not very much Congress can do to rein in this administration or direct this president in any way if he's committed to working in an extra constitutional fashion continually. But I did leave Keystone XL pipeline out of this by accident, not on purpose. I'm 100% for building that pipeline. There's no rational reason not to build that pipeline. And the Canadians are going to ship that oil over to China if we don't build the pipeline down through. The Ogallala Aquifer and the Sand Hills in Nebraska are really not environmental factors in this. Pipelines are the safest and cheapest way to move liquid and that includes petroleum and it, water floats on oil so if a little oil got on the aquifer down there at the Ogallala you pump that off that's why we can recover oil from wells in the first place it floats on the aquifer and uh, so but I remember what happened in Alaska when we wanted to build a pipeline the Alaska pipeline it took Congress to say we're waiving all environmental barriers we're suspending all litigation and we're gonna build the pipeline that language is there I I've read that language. We could go back and review it. We could even conceivably pass it with a majority of the United States Senate, but I'm not convinced this president wouldn't veto it. Thank you. David Martosco. Um, shift gears for a second. Let's talk about uh, eggs. All right. <laughs> the, um, the Humane Society of the United States has been kind of a burr under your saddle for a while. Uh, and I think I understand why. They're basically like, if you don't know who they are, they're basically like PETA with a really nice wristwatch and nicer <laughs> shoes. And, and they pretend they run pet shelters, but they don't. Set that aside for a minute. Um, talk a little bit about this multi-state lawsuit against California. What's the genesis behind it? What did California decide to do statutorily that so much offends the other states? Okay. Well, we know that in the Constitution, uh, there, there, one of the enumerated powers is, is, the, it, it is the congressional authority to regulate interstate commerce, the Commerce Clause. And California passed a referendum that directed that the eggs within California that are produced in California will be laid by, first they wanted to be free-range hens, and then it became double the cage size. That's okay. California can regulate their producers there. They can regulate them out of business if they choose. That's a state right. But they passed a statute that regulated the eggs coming into California would also be by the same standard. That violates the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. That's also true with gestation crates for hogs, stalls for veal calves, a uh, number of other items. So it is a clear constitutional violation. I introduced a bill that became an amendment in the Farm Bill that didn't, uh, didn't make the final version that prohibits the states from regulating the means of production of a list of agriculture products. It's very, very consistent with the Commerce Clause in the Constitution. If we allow California to regulate, to tell somebody in Iowa or New Hampshire or wherever, here's the kind of cage you're going to put your hens in or you're not going to be able to deliver eggs to the huge market. If we allow that, we end up with 50 states with 50 rules and we are no longer the 50 state free trade zone that was envisioned early on by our founders. And that's what's at stake here. The lawsuit is filed by the Attorney General of the State of Missouri. Missouri, and five or six states have joined it. It's a, it's a good suit for a good reason, but I'm concerned that all our eggs are in one lawsuit basket. We need more lawsuits, David. <laughs> more lawsuits from a Republican. Wow, listen to that. Um, just one, one level lower here. I mean, obviously you say the state did this, the state of California decided. I mean, it was the animal rights lobby that pushed this, that generated the support for it, that raised money to pass it. So what you really have is, I think, in some corners is the agricultural belt of the United States against the animal rights lobby. What is that, how, how much harder does that make your job? You're fighting uh, about facts over here and about emotion over there. Is it even possible to have a discussion and compromise with those people? Well, we, we didn't have actually a discussion. Uh, my, well, we had, a, we had a debate in the Ag Committee, but after that, I was a conferee on the, on the Farm Bill. There was no discussion on my amendment. The Senate refused to discuss it. The Debbie Stabenow, the chair in the, in, in, the, in the Senate, would not allow her staff to even utter a word to talk into our negotiating staff. So it's emotion against reason. And uh, by the way, HSUS, so Humane Society of the United States, is the vegan lobby. And it's fine with me if they want to be vegans. It's just not fine with me if they want everybody to be vegans. SteveKing.com. Yeah, take a couple more questions. Try to get that in. I um, the next question. Uh, not yet. We're going to take one from I'm, the audience. I'm just wondering what you think of Richard Vigory's comments uh, with regard to the Republican establishment going after the Tea Party. Well, I saw it happen, and I've, I've seen the attitude of it, and it's debilitating to our conservative cause. And when I... When, 
when uh, when the class of 2010, the 87 freshman Republicans were elected to Congress, I called them God's gift to America. They came as a solid coalition of constitutional conservatives. There was a calculated effort on the part of our leadership to fracture the cohesiveness of the class of, of the, there was 87 that were elected in 2010. And that has gone on since then. The disrespect and the contempt for constitutional conservatives in the Congress uh, is palpable, it's stark, and it's coming out once or twice a week, some of it from our speaker and some of it within the last week. Let's take a question from the audience. Any questions on here? Okay. I saw that hand go up first. I'll hold it. Oh, thanks. Um, you, you went on about energy, so I'd like to ask you, it seems like a big interest of yours. Um, MTBE, well, you, you, you said that ethanol doesn't, or corn isn't receiving any subsidies. I, I would ask this question. By banning MTBE, I think that was probably the biggest subsidy the, the, the guys up there could have gotten in, your, in your, your constituents. So I have to ask you this, as a policymaker, banning MTBE, um, which excuse was leaking the groundwater, of course, that had nothing to do with it. It really was to support the, the farmers, the corn producers. What that did is two things. One, it raised the gas price at the pump about 20, 25 cents on average. And secondly, you can't pipeline uh, ethanol. Uh, it, so the question, so pragmatism versus conservatism cons uh, versus being a Republican. Conservatives like to make decisions based on what's good for the country, not, not constituents in a certain area. MTB added 25, 30 cents per gallon to, to price of gas at the pump. I'd like to know what you think about that. Well, I, I'll just say that I, I'm not convinced on the science side of this that there's not a problem of MTBs in our water. But uh, just I'll concede your point to that so we don't get into that discussion. Uh, in a way, it's a little bit of where you sit is where you stand in that would, if, we, if, we read, if, we did, if we went down the route that you're suggesting, then are we subsidizing the petroleum industry? Are we giving them back a, a monopoly? And what I've said is now we, have, now we have alternative fuels in the marketplace. If you can bring in more liquid uh, um, alternative fuels, I'm for that. And uh, let's, let's get so that we can get this energy pie to grow, grow the size of the energy pie, as I said, and let competition take this thing. But the, uh, there is, and I should speak openly on this, there is a renewable fuel standard. And that directs how much, how much renewable fuel is to be blended in a year. The EPA has rolled that down. I don't agree with that, but that works against us. Now, if it's 25%, high, 25 cents higher because of MTBEs being banned, uh, we can talk about the environmental side of that. But on the other hand, it's 50 cents, maybe a dollar and a half lower because there's competition that comes from that 24% of the domestically produced gallons that are going into our gas burning vehicles. So it's one, I'd say it's, there, there's both sides to this question. And I, and I think that it's important that you brought up another side of the angle. Um, now you can, your website. Oh yes, in case I didn't bring it up, <laughs> steveking.com. Thank you, Marilyn. Congressman Steve King from the 4th Congressional District. Okay, uh,